Wonderful. Okay, we'll just wait a few minutes for everyone to start to enter the room. Give it just a few minutes. Wonderful. It's nice seeing everybody making time and their beautiful day. I hope your day is sunny. I'm in beautiful Chicago, Illinois, where it is sunny and warm and it feels like spring. So I hope wherever you are in the world that you're having a lovely, beautiful, uh, sunny day and that your week is going well. I see a few people still trickling in. Wonderful. Well, welcome to the Disability Research and Education in Academic Medicine, or DREAM, Research Rounds. My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm the Executive Director for the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and I'm an associate professor of learning health sciences and family medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School, Go Blue. Um, the aim of our dream research rounds is to provide monthly grand rounds and the monthly rounds in the tradition of grand rounds, which will highlight research and research teams from around the globe that are focused on disability research and academic medicine. Up until today, I very purposely made sure that my team's research has been pulled back and not and not um, kind of the presenting first few talks. Um, but today I am really, really proud to introduce you to someone from my lab, Riley Bechkol. And Riley is the 2023-24 research assistant for the Meeks Research Lab. She comes to our team from Denison University and is excited to get involved in research focused on disability and medical education. Riley's future goals include entering a clinical psychology program and eventually using her skills and experiences that she has here with our team to work with children and adolescents with disabilities using a strengths-based approach. And her work will be really important because she will be able to, um, in a very informed way, let these children and adolescents know that medicine is a place for them and health professions is a place for them and to help them understand their ability to enter health professions trainings. Today is Riley's very first presentation as part of our group, and she will be presenting a paper that was the very first paper she worked on with our group. So if everyone will help me, I'd like to welcome future Dr. Riley Bechkol. Thank you so much, Lisa, for the thoughtful introduction. It's been so good to work with you, and it is my pleasure to be here today speaking with you about the topic that is assessment of institutionally reported disability prevalence and accommodation use in U.S. allopathic medical schools from 2015 to 2022 changes under COVID conditions. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the amazing people from the Docs with Disabilities Initiative at Meeks Lab. The names listed here are those who have authored this publication we are discussing today. I especially want to thank the first author and senior author who have been mentors to me. It has been an amazing experience learning from and working with all of them. So let's begin with our first point in this grand round presentation, which is the data that underscores the need for a better understanding of disability in medicine. The World Health Organization report on disability estimated that about 1.3 billion people worldwide live with disability. And with our population aging and more and more people living with chronic health conditions, this number is only increasing. This makes people with disabilities one of the largest minority groups in the whole world. This group is a very diverse group, not only in terms of their experiences living with disability and the types of disability, but also in how their disability identity intersects with several other identities in our society. So it is clear that there is no way our world can achieve health
Is the interpreter, we've lost the sound. Competent in their ability to provide the same quality of care for patients with disabilities. Another study shows 64% of physicians say this lack of competence comes from a lack of information. One way to increase this understanding is through greater inclusion and support of disabled physicians and trainees. An amounting body of research suggests that a diverse physician workforce benefits all patients, all students, all physicians, and the healthcare system as a whole. This is why it is essential to be aware of the current prevalence and experiences of students and trainees with disabilities in the medical fields. The study we are discussing today with a third wave of a four-part longitudinal prevalence study of institutionally reported disability in U.S. allopathic medical programs. The study was designed to benchmark and follow the number of allopathic medical students who disclose a disability and register with disability services over a period of 10 years. In 2021, wave three captured data during the COVID-19 pandemic and consequential remote delivery of curriculum, which carries potential consequences for students with disabilities, including their accommodation needs. The aims of this most recent wave were similar to the first two. To observe if there was any growth in the population of students with disabilities, and if any changes had occurred within specific categories of disability. However, due to the circumstances of 2021, we were able to observe if any unique changes occurred in the population as a result of the changes that were made to the format of education during the COVID pandemic. This study has yet to be published, but it completed its most recent wave in January of 2022. 154 fully accredited U.S. allopathic medical schools with a total of 36,322 students were measured in this study using the same survey as the previous two waves to maintain internal validity. However, it should be noted that only 56 schools responded in all three years and were thus available for comparison. The web-based survey was sent to institutionally designated disability administrators at eligible allopathic medical schools who have a federally mandated duty to assist qualified students with disabilities. Eligible schools were identified through a registry maintained by the Association of American Medical Colleges. New schools and those with probationary accreditation or on probation were excluded. Participation was maximized through direct emails to disability administrators AAMC outreach to student affair deans at eligible schools encouraging participation, and phone calls to non-responding schools after six and nine months. The survey was designed by experts in medical school disability administration based on provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act and prior research. The survey was pilot tested by five schools and then refined, and it assessed the following domains. The total number of self disclosed or registered students with disabilities receiving accommodations, the demographic characteristics of students with disabilities, categories of disabilities, and approved accommodations. The third wave of this study sent out the described survey and collected data between July 2021 and January 2022. After all data from the third wave was collected, Differences in the overall proportions of students with disabilities and disability types were compared across the present 2021 and prior 2015 and 2019 waves. Pairwise comparisons between the proportions of disability and accommodation use across all waves were assessed using Z-tests. P-values were adjusted for multiple comparisons using Bonferroni correction. Sensitivity analysis was performed using data from schools represented in all waves and the University of Colorado School Institutional Review Board exempted this study. Now we can move on to the second part of this grand rounds presentation, the results of the study. In 2021, 56 schools responded to the survey, identifying 2,125 students with disabilities, which is a total of 5.85% of the student body. Wave one of this prevalence study in 2015 found only 2.76% of the student body self-reported disability. Wave two in 2019 found 4.62% of the student body had reported self-disability, 
which is a relative increase from 2015 to 2019 of 69%. So Waves 3's findings of 5.85% are significantly higher than previous studies have estimated. The relative increase alone was 26.6% from 2019 and 112% from 2015. Overall, the population of students reporting attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, chronic health, and psychological disabilities statistically increased across all three waves. ADHD increased from 0.9% of the total student body in 2015 to 1.4% in 2019 and 1.7% in 2021. Psychological disabilities increased from 0.6% in 2015 to 1.4% in 2019 and 1.9% in 2021. And chronic health disabilities went from 0.4% in 2015 to 0.9% in 2019 and 1.1% 1 .1 in 2021. Of the students who identified as having a disability, 32.7% of them reported having ADHD in 2015, 29.4% in 2019, and 29.6% in 2021. Of the students who reported having a psychological disability, they made up 20.2% of the students with disabilities in 2015, 31% in 2019, and 33% in 2021. And of the students who reported chronic health disabilities, they were 13.1% of the student body with disabilities in 2015, and 18.5% in 2019. All of these increases were statistically significant. Within the disability population, the only category that significantly declined were learning disabilities from 2019 to 2021, going from 18.2% .2 to 13%. Out of the whole student body, the students who reported a learning disability only made up 0.83% of the population in 2019 and 0.76% in 2021. This study also looked at the changes in the number of requests for accommodations by the students who identified as having a disability. The term accommodation may be used to describe an alteration of the environment, curriculum format, or equipment that allows an individual with a disability to gain access to content and or complete assigned tasks. They enable students with disabilities to pursue a regular course of study. And since accommodations do not alter what is being taught, instructors should be able to implement the same grading scale for students with disabilities as they do for students without disabilities. Some examples of accommodations include release from clinic for appointments, extended time for students with fine motor limitations, visual impairments, or learning disabilities, assistive technologies such as computer text-to-speech or computer-based systems for students with visual impairments or dyslexia, sign language interpreters for students who are deaf, and recorded lectures. The percentage of students with disabilities requesting most types of didactic testing-related accommodations significantly decreased from 2019 to 2021. Specifically, reduced distraction requests decreased from 57.9% in 2019 to 51.1% in 2021. Private environment requests decreased from 8.7% to 6.2, and requests for additional exam time decreased from 74.9% in 2019 to 66.9% in 2021. For non-testing didactic accommodations, significant increases from 2019 to 2021 were observed. For recorded lectures, there was an increase from 5.6% in 2019 to 10.2% in 2021, and text-to-speech slash speech-to-text increased from 2.2% in 2019 to 3.7% in 2021. While for programmatic requests, there was a significant decrease from 2.6% in 2019 to 1.6% in 2021, and requests for housing accommodations decreased from 4.6% to 2.2%. Both of these decreases can be clearly explained by the lack of students physically on campus during the COVID-19 pandemic. Clinical testing accommodations, however, significantly increased from 2019 to 2021. Requests for extra time went from 37.8% in 2019 to 45.1% in 2021, and reduced distraction for clinical exams increased from 31% to 42.2%.
For clinical accommodations, significant increases from 2019 to 2021 were observed only for simulation lab, going from 0.3% to 0.8, and requests for release from clinic for appointments, which increased from 5.3% to 2019 to 7.7% in 2021. Limitations include potential underestimates resulting from non-disclosure of disability, a known phenomenon, and lower response rate. However, sensitivity analysis of schools represented in all three ways suggest similar prevalence estimates and data are institutionally verified, increasing its accuracy. Though not possible to capture from this survey, we hypothesize that the increase in disability prevalence may be a result of more applicants with disabilities being admitted to medical school, more existing students disclosing a disability, better reporting of disability data, or increased development of psychological disability while attending medical school. This study identified a higher prevalence of disability among students in US allopathic medical schools than in prior studies. Despite the stigma surrounding psychological and chronic health disabilities, these categories showed the largest increase. These results underscore the limitations of studying isolated subtypes of disabilities, for example, only mobility impairments, which may underestimate this population. The preponderance of students with ADHD, learning disabilities, and psychological disabilities suggest that these disability subtypes should be included in future research efforts, such as studies assessing the performance of appropriately accommodated students. One effective way to improve inclusion is to ensure that curricula and assessments work for people with many different learning styles, an approach called universal design instruction. Universal design refers to broad spectrum ideas meant to produce buildings, products, and environments that are inherently accessible to people with and without disabilities. Some examples are presenting materials in multiple formats, videos, small groups, and lectures, to name a few which not only helps students with learning disabilities, but numerous other students who also benefit from varied approaches. Taking a universal design approach means all activities are planned to be accessible from the outset, not just in response to specific requests. Studies have also shown that universal design often improves performance for students with disabilities and reduces their time to graduation. So what does universal design have to do with this research? Well, as we noted, most didactic-related testing accommodations significantly decreased from 2019 to 2021, which was quite unusual when compared to the increase in students with disabilities in the population. However, we hypothesize the reduction in didactic-related testing accommodations may have been due to the remote delivery of curriculum during the pandemic, allowing students to create optimal learning in testing environments. Disability disclosure continues to increase among medical students and decreases in the reporting of learning disabilities and requests for testing accommodations during the pandemic. Schools should consider enhancing accessible experiences for all learners by retaining remote testing to let students optimize their testing environment, also known as leading into the universal design approach. Future studies should evaluate whether changes remain with the return to in-person learning. Additionally, Though an increase in disability was observed, this data does not provide information about the culture that these students experience or their retention in the training and career pipeline. Therefore, further research is needed as documenting representation is only a first step towards enhancing the inclusion of persons with disabilities in medicine. So here's what we know. We know that the numbers of students with disabilities continue to climb. We know that even with these climbing numbers, there's still a population that is not disclosing due to fear of bias. We know that that leads us to the hypothesis that these numbers are underestimates of the actual population of learners with disabilities. We also know that learners with cognitive disabilities score lower on standardized assessments and take a longer time to graduate, but ultimately match into residency. We have hypothesized that barriers to accommodation are the drivers of the lower scores and the extended time to graduation. And this study supports the idea that barriers to accommodation may be removed through universal design, which may then positively impact the performance of students with cognitive disabilities. And now time for questions. 
Wow. Uh, Riley, that was amazing. And I was sitting here thinking about when I had just graduated from undergraduate and getting involved in advanced work. I don't think I could have given a presentation that was that together, um, that succinct, and I'm just blown away. Thank you so much. And for this to be your first presentation, I feel like I would speak for everybody in the audience to say, brava, um, wonderful job. And thank you so much for sharing this really important paper that we're hoping to have published very soon. So as Riley said, it is time for questions and we are going to go ahead and stop the recording. So let me do that really quickly.